Vint is the first fully transparent wine investment platform genuinely accessible to everyone. For less than $100, you can own SEC qualified shares of the best wines in the world. The Vint Wine Investment Podcast offers up-to-date information on the world of wine and investing, as well as current perspectives on our collections and the wine markets in general. Enjoy the show. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Vint Wine Investment Podcast. As always, my name is Billy Galingo, and I'm the head of wine here at Vint. Today's episode is going to be all about the Rhone Valley. This is because, as many of you know, our first Rhone Valley collection launched on December 15th, so that just this past Wednesday, at the time of recording here, and it's a, it's a really big region. It's really diverse. There's a lot to talk about, um, a lot to learn. So for anybody who has invested or is thinking about investing, um, we want to continue to provide you with uh, all the materials you need to really learn about not only the wines in our collection, but the Rhone Valley as a whole. So as part of this, we're going to dive into a little bit about the Northern Rhone today in this podcast. But um, as we mentioned in our last podcast, we're excited to mention that uh, Patrick Will of Ventus um, will be doing a Rhone Valley kind of masterclass deep dive on Monday morning. We're going to have an educational presentation. Um, He's putting together slides and he will be walking us through the Rhone Valley. Um, A little bit of background on Patrick Will. He has been um, the exclusive importer for Gigal for over 25 years. His former company that he and a partner started were originally the importers for Gigal's wines. Um, and that company was acquired by Ventus, where he is still working closely with the Gigal family to represent their wines in America. Um, as part of this effort and work with Gigal, he has received the um, Brotherhood of Chateauneuf de Pop. Um, basically he's been inducted into the organization that, you know, represents people who have really progressed the region or made a big impact in some way. Uh, he was also the person of the year for the Hospice du Rhone, which is held every year in Paso Robles to really highlight Rhone wines and Rhone varietals. Um, so it's, it's really exciting. We're really happy to have him on board, uh, for this presentation. And we're looking forward to sharing that with you all. It will be on Monday at 1 p.m. East Coast time, 10 a.m. Pacific time. In addition to Patrick and this podcast, I've also written an article um, about the Northern Rhone, kind of giving perspective as to where it is in the investment market, um, how it compares to a couple other regions, but really just kind of giving a deep dive into what makes the region's wines um, so sought after and how they compare in volume and value to the Southern Rhone. Um and then that's, there's, there's plenty of fun tidbits there. So keep it, keep an eye out. Um, we'll share that across email and on our social channels as well. But today I really want to dive in not only to the Northern Rhone. So we're going to focus on the Northern Rhone, but we're going to dive deeper into the two sub appellations within the Northern Rhone area that are featured in this collection. Uh, those two being Hermitage and Cote Roti. Both of these regions are known for their red wines. Um, while they are, both predominantly made of the Syrah grape. Um, each region does allow a little bit of white grapes to be fermented with the red grape Syrah, mainly to give it a little bit of aromatic lift, help fix some color, and to really bring out the most interesting characteristics of the Syrah grape. Sometimes a little bit of white grape really helps, you know, kind of amplify some of the best characteristics of the, the core varietal there. Um, so we're going to start in Cote Roti. That's the furthest north. So we're going to start there and work our way down. So Cote Roti. The first thing you need to know about Cote Roti is its steep slopes. Uh, there's a lot of jagged, rocky outcrops. The hillside is extremely steep, which makes farming on this area very, very difficult. Um, it takes a lot of manpower. Very few machines can get anywhere near the the main part of the vineyard. So the vines are all managed and tended and harvested by hand. Um, The vines are all basically tied to singular uh, stakes rather than kind of that trellising system you'll see in some other vineyards. Um, And this again is due to number one, the slope, but number two, also the higher winds that kind of rip down the Rhone Valley. Um, There's this cool, um, basically frigid wind that can get up to you know 50 plus miles an hour coming from the Alps called Le Mistral uh, that blows down the northern Rhone and really cools down the area. So these these vines kind of just cling to these cliff sides 
Um, and, you know, that part of that struggle is what produces such interesting flavors in the grapes. The name Koroti actually means roasted slope. It comes from this amphitheater like angle that the vines all sit on uh, that face the sun and really just kind of amplify its its energy and help ripen the grapes, even though it's farther up north. Uh, this this angle, this aspect um, catches the sun and allows it to really still ripen and create those great flavors. Um, there are two real macro terroirs, if you will, within Cote Roti, um, the Cote Brune and the Cote Blonde. There are actual uh, geological region, reasons for these names, but we can start with the kind of fanciful story behind it. Uh, one of the stories was the ruler in the Cote Roti back in, you know, hundreds of years ago, had two daughters. One was blonde, one was a brunette. So he gave half the vineyard to one and called it Cote Brune, the other one to the other, calling it Cote Blonde. Um, the real kind of reason behind these names, um, there are vineyards within each section with these names, but um, Cote Brune ha- tends to have these iron-rich soils that tend to be darker in color. Um, these soils also produce a bigger, more muscular muscular kind of tannic wine. Um, And then on the other side, Cote Blonde, the soils tend to be more made of granite and nice, um, a little sandier and lighter overall, creating a kind of a more finesse driven aromatic uh, expression of Syrah. So there is actual reasons um, behind, you know, kind of the naming aside from some of these just stories or pure subjectivity. Um, The wines in our collection that are sourced from Cote Roti are... The Lala's. These are the the famous Gigal um, Lala wines. Basically, they're named as such because each of the names, La Moulin, La Landon, and La Turk, all start with La. Uh, we will learn a lot more about that on Monday when we have Patrick Will on. But what's interesting is they kind of run the gamut between Cote Brune and Cote Blonde expressions of wine. Um, La Landon is in uh, Cote Brune, which you know makes it a little bit of a bigger. Uh, more muscular wine. Um, La Moline is in the Cote Blonde, which makes it kind of a little bit of a lighter wine. And La Turque actually is, I think, just over in Cote Brune. We'll learn more from Patrick Will, but it kind of has expressions of both Cote Brune and Cote Blonde. Um, and it is also the youngest um, vine. So that, that gives it a little bit of a different profile between the two. Um, but Cote Roti as a whole, compared to something like, say, Hermitage, is known for being more finesse-driven wines. Um, it still has these deep, dark, meaty Syrahs that, you know, the Northern Road is known for. Uh, the, the grape really expresses this kind of meaty, some almost a blood-like character up there. But on top of that, you'll get more, you can get more violet, you can get more finesse, and this underlying fresh acidity that you get out of wines from Cote Roti, and along with this minerality is, it's kind of unmatched. Um, the rest of the region kind of tends to be a little bigger and a little bulkier in terms of tannins and structure um, when you get down to Hermitage and Cornas, which is another region in the Northern Rhone. So with that, let's move on down to Hermitage. We're basically riding south down the Rhone River uh, until we reach this little special area where the river that normally runs north to south takes a random short left turn east Um, This bend in the river is occupied by this giant kind of hill that overlooks this pass. Um, An old legend has it that an old knight who basically was decommissioned from fighting uh, left the military and went and lived up there as a hermit um, for the rest of his life. Hence the name Hermitage or, um, you know, the wine called La Hermite, which is in our collection. So there's this whole kind of myth around the hermit who lived there. Uh, but basically is this giant hill that faces south in the Northern Rhone, which is very important because it is cool up in this region. Like, like in Cote Roti, you needed this special geological aspect to capture the light to ripen the grapes. So this big hill facing south is basically like a big solar panel that is just absorbing the light into these grapes. Uh, so again, with that, more sunlight means riper grapes, bigger tannins, um, higher alcohols as a whole. So Hermitage tends to be these bigger, bold, kind of uh, juicier wines than those you'll find in Cote Roti. Um, these wines were actually so big and you know, consistently ripe that uh, wine from Hermitage was actually used to be sent over to Bordeaux on years where the Bordeaux wines were considered thin in the 1800s to really amplify that and kind of give it more body and flavor. Um 
Hermitage is definitely the most famous of the sub appellations in the Northern Rhone. Um, the likes of Thomas Jefferson went to go visit there. Um, he was actually a fan of the Hermitage Blanc, which is made predominantly of Marsan and Roussan. Um, but this area has basically, in this region, the wines from here have been famous for centuries and centuries. And only um, recently is it really starting to come back into the the main forefront in the rest of the world. It's kind of been like a sommelier and wine connoisseur secret, um, just due to the fact that after phylloxera in the late 1800s um, killed a lot of the vines on the hill, and then World War One and World War II um, really decimated uh, the populations of the area. So it's taken a, a long time to rebound, but the wines are are finally getting the respect they deserve again on a on a world stage. Um, diving into Hermitage a little bit more as a region, there are two main climat or vineyards, large vineyards that are. Uh, basically indicative, kind of blended into every Hermitage that comes out of the area. Um, most of the wines from Hermitage are blends of different parcels on Hermitage. There are a few that are are single parcels, um, which we'll, we'll touch on here shortly. But the two main vineyards or climat are Le Bessard and La Miel. La Miel. Um, Le Bessard is more mineral and granite, um, producing fine tannin and structure, um, a little bit more structure forward on that side. Uh, this is what goes into um, or acts as the backbone in um, some Chave Hermitage. There's a producer named Jean-Louis Chave. He's not featured in our collection, but I recommend you seek him out. He brings amazing wines. Um, and then La Miel, La Miel um, is what the Jaboulet um, Hermitage that we have in our collection is really um, based on. And these are wines that come from soils that are more glacial, pebbly like limestone and kind of produce a, a wine that's more juicy and fleshy overall. Um, you may ask, you know, I thought this was one hill. How does it have so many different soils? Well, it's, over the years, the geological forces have really created a lot of even smaller than these two vineyard um, little areas of different it's not that quite terroir um because they're still getting kind of the same sunlight but you know as the hill turns everywhere it gets a little bit of different soils a little bit of different aspect a little bit of sunlight so there there are a lot of differences on this one hill um like we mentioned earlier there are a couple single vineyard uh wines coming from Hermitage. one of them is the chapoutier Armit which is featured in this collection uh, that comes from a little 9.5 acre parcel near the top of Hermitage and produces its own kind of unique characteristics, um, still on granite um, and still, you know, very well structured and big like most Hermitage, but it has a few of its own unique um, flavor and aromatic profiles compared to the other wines that makes it kind of stand out and is why it's bottled on its own. So one thing to note, for both Cote Road Tea and Hermitage in general, um, and the Northern Road as a whole, which in includes another sub-appellation called Cornas, which I've mentioned and kind of touch on more in my article as well, is in the whole Rhone Valley, north and south, only 5% of the total volume of wine comes from the Northern Rhone. So the Southern Rhone makes a majority of the wines, 95%. And of that 5% that the Northern Rhone makes, only half of that so 2.5% of the total amount is made in Cornas, Hermitage, and Cote Roti, which Cote Roti makes more than um, Hermitage and Cornas. So what's, what's interesting there is really thinking about the small yields that come from here. Everybody thinks that Burgundy is where the small yield, um, high quality wines come from. But the Northern Rhone really takes that to a whole nother level. Uh, there are single vineyard line wines like the Lala's. Um, but what makes it different here is not only the small size of the vineyard. So sure, the vineyards can be about the same size as Burgundy. But you have to remember that the farmers here, the wine growers, as they want to be known as vigneron, um, are working on extremely steep slopes, doing everything by hand. It's kind of backbreaking work. And they're producing these wines, you know, in the 400 cases per year, under a thousand regularly, even smaller than those amounts. And these wines are amazingly well priced. The top wines from this region will cost you a fraction of what the top wines from Bordeaux or Burgundy will cost. So it, it's really interesting to kind of 
look at the price to value ratio and you really realize why the the Northern Rhone and the Rhone Valley as a whole is kind of coming back into appreciation by collectors and investors because it's really being led by the sommeliers of the world, the people who really understand the nuances of what goes into making a wine, the quality that's coming out of the region, um, these really complex aromatics and everything that comes out of basically being grown on really steep slopes and farmed by hand. Uh, so the region's really interesting. I encourage everyone to go out and try a bottle of their own. Um, we'll be talking with Patrick on Monday, Patrick Will, and he will let you know a little bit more about Gigal and the Gigal wines in general. And there, there's a lot of entry-level wines from Cote Roti and Hermitage and um, Chateau Neuf de Pop, which is further south, that you can try and really get a sense of what the region's about. So with that, I will leave you here until next week. Thanks again for tuning in to the podcast, and I will talk to you next week. Cheers. Hey, everybody. Um, today, topic for the day is going to be the financialization of wine. So you might think, oh, isn't that exactly what Vint is doing? Yes, but it, we're, we're just getting started um, and think that there's more and more tools and metrics and um, ways for people to think about um, wine and um, alternative assets as a whole um, in a more traditional financial product sense. Um, my opinion, that's where... Um, this industry is going. And if you can um, format tools and products in a way that um, the traditional financial industry is used to, you're going to have a, a leg up when entering those markets. So one thing that we've been looking at creating is, is a matrix to help people um, diversify, um, inspired by Morningstar and also one of our um, users on our platform, we've been working hand in hand with him to create this matrix. And we've identified um, five variables. There's two sets in the variable that um, two sets of variables that we're, we're interested in. So one would be the, the traditional large, mid, small. Um, we have some thoughts on how we're going to um, qualify those categories, and then value and growth. Um, and for those of you who are not necessarily familiar with those terms um, in the, the public markets, large cap, and these are up for debate, um, is generally companies above $5 billion. Um, mid cap, actually, uh, large is uh, north of 20, sorry. Um, mid would be somewhere from 2 to 15 to 20. And then um, small cap would be um, less than $2 billion in market cap. So it's a general way that people classify funds and different financial products. Um, second is value and growth. Um, value versus growth has been a pretty common um debate recently. People think they're mutually exclusive. I, I do not. Um, growth, um, it is synonymous with momentum stocks. Um, their top line and earnings are generally growing at a, a faster clip than value stocks. Um, however, if you look at how they trade on a multiple basis, they are um, more expensive generally. Value, on the other hand, you're looking for companies that are mispriced to their intrinsic value. Um, you know, I, I believe you can have growth companies like that as well, but uh, from a more traditional value sense, um, you're looking for lower multiple companies um, and trying to find the value there. So taking those principles and applying them to the wine industry, we have some interesting ideas. Um, so from a um, value versus growth perspective, I think one way to quantify this, because as we, as we think about this, the most important thing for us is going to be remaining consistent uh, across 
regions, vintages, and how can we do so in a um, a well-defined um, manner. So for value, we're thinking price to score ratio could be a good way um, to evaluate um, value versus growth. So um, you could have a 100-point Robert Parker scored wine that's trading at... Um, say $300 a bottle, um, and then you could have, say, like a Screaming Eagle um, 2015, 100-point Robert Parker score that is trading at north of $3,500, maybe $4,000 a bottle. So Screaming Eagle would fall into the uh, the growth category, um, and um, the previous bottle would fall into the value category. And then when it comes to large cap, mid cap, small cap, um, we're thinking liquidity could be a good way to um, judge this. Um, so in the, the large cap category, um, the percent of wine traded uh, this year, so we can reference LiveX there um, to identify the, the blue chip large cap Wines mid cap could be the ones that are trending upwards and growing, and then the emerging markets are um, just entering the global stage um, of wine trading. So, Bordeaux and Burgundy in the blue chip, um, Champagne, Spain, USA in the mid cap, Austria, South America, South Africa um, could all be in that emerging markets category. So it's something that we're continuing to work on and it could be incorporated in our one pagers. But yeah, we'll, we'll continue to think about more and more metrics um, to help people um, evaluate their uh, wine investment decisions. For questions, comments, or feedback on the Vint Wine Investment Podcast, please email us at support at vint.co. To check out our current offerings and to sign up for the Vint platform, find us at www.vint.co. That's www.vint.co. Vint and VV Markets are offering securities pursuant to Regulation A. Our offering circular as amended can be found on the SEC website. Past performance is no guarantee of future results. Investments such as those on the Vint platform are speculative and involve substantial risk to consider before investing. We may provide communication that may contain certain forward-looking statements that are subject to various risks and uncertainties. Information provided in any communications is not legal, business, or tax advice. All prospective investors should consult a legal, tax, or business advisor concerning the subject matter of any communications and any offering.